is the last session of the day. Yay. Um, this is, though, more importantly, your opportunity to ask uh, the panel anything that has crossed your mind during the day for which you don't yet have an answer. There's a wide range of skills up here, um, and we're here for as long as is necessary, so please ask your questions. We have, I'm afraid, roving mics, and I've been asked to ask the speaker, and I'm not sure if I really want to say this, to stand up when they're asking their questions um, so that they can be filmed, which sounds a bit cruel if you're being brave enough to ask a question. So uh, at the risk of upsetting the people videoing it, don't stand up if you don't want to. But if you feel keen and proud, then do please feel free to stand up. Um, and I'm just vamping, waiting for someone to put their hand up. Thank you very much. There's a question down here. Uh, hello, Justin O'Shaughnessy from Shoreditch Trust. Um, I'm actually just curious in terms of the, the way the funding works and the, the second and third year talking about the artistic contribution. How much, in terms of a funding bid, how, what, what percentages is one supposed to use both in terms of match funding and core fu or, or funding from the Arts Council from this project to actually deliver projects and how much to continue developing capacity? Because if you, for instance, asked for 150,000 over three years and then matched it, you'd have 275,000 or something. Does one then have to say, well, in 2014-15, we will be delivering this project that will cost that much, which is some of that money? Or it all has to go... So the, I'm, not, I'm, just, it's curious, I'm just trying to work out what the artistic contribution bit means, I suppose, and how funds can be attached to that, or if they can. Does that make sense? We did, we did answer this question this morning. Were you in the room when we did? I so, was, so I okay, no, no, I obviously didn't make it clear, so I'll try again. Um, I know it's complicated. Well, I didn't realize it was complicated until I started doing the workshops. What we are trying to do, and I, this doesn't seem to be on either. I'm really doing well this afternoon. Can anybody hear, can you hear me at the back? Okay, all right, that's fine, good, I shall project. Um, <coughs> think about capacity building and separate that out. So it, if you want to make a step change in your fundraising and your capability of diversifying event, all the rest of it, think about what you might want from us in terms of capacity building. Separately, think about what you might be doing in terms of increasing private giving. And that's the element that you put in your plan that you want us to match fund. Okay. The additional artistic contribution, which is we did talk about this morning, and I, I know we got a bit wobbly on it and a bit woolly on it. I think what we're trying to say is don't stick it all on sorting out the boiler. You know, some of you have got plans that go several years out that you've got in your, if you're an MPO, that you've got them in your um, funding agreement already. And, you're, and as one of the theatres, I think, said this morning, you know, that's the plan. I can't suddenly add in. We haven't got the capacity to add in some additional project. So don't try and worry about linking it to the project, but do talk about how, the, you know, additional money will help you in terms of artistic contribution going forward. Try and make it at a strategic level. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. A bit. <laughs> Come up, discuss it with your local office. Come up, if they think it's reasonable and it's a step change as far as they're concerned, lob the plan in, okay? They're, they know you better than, than, than we do in the national office, so have the conversation with your local office, okay? Oh, there's a question down here. Whilst the microphone is getting to this question, I, Ginny asked me to say a few words about donor benefits and, well, and about Sorry. donations versus naming rights and sponsorship and all that. I would argue that as long as the, the, the money has been given doesn't and the benefits being given in return don't breach the gift aid benefit rules, <coughs> consider it as a donation. But if they are breaching those rules, um, whether it's a naming rights or whether it's a sponsorship, then it doesn't come under catalyst. I would have thought that would be a fairly simple rule of thumb to go by. Question. This is actually just, oh, that's very loud. This is actually just a kind of point of clarity from what you've just said, Ginny, which is, are you looking at it as a step change in fundraising capacity in order to, from 2015 onwards, make a step change in delivery rather than a step change in delivery demonstrated through the application? Is that, does that make sense? You're looking for us to change our fundraising capacity radically so that towards the end of those three years we are doing more art, but we won't be doing more art as a result of this in 2012. I think that's a very fair assumption. Okay, thank what you. we're trying to do is we're trying to take 
what the, the government's, the Secretary of State's philanthropy agenda, as you know, and we talked about endowments, and then we were trying to build on it and tie it around goal three as well. That may have made it confusing. And trying to say, okay, this is an opportunity for us to help the arts sector develop organisational resilience. Okay, and that's why in the guidance I'd put a whole load of stuff around the sort of things you might think about for capacity building, which I do know says corporate sponsorship. And all I'm saying to you is don't use the corporate sponsorship for the, for the match funding. Okay, if I get that message across, then that's... Other than that, it's use your common sense, discuss it with your local office. Okay? A question over there. Thank you very much. Wait for the mic. Rose Fenton, free word. This is really a question about... Is this a one-off programme or is it a rolling programme? So, for example, if one was to apply to the capacity building pot of, is it seven million? Mm -hmm. And then in a year's time, you thought, great, I'm now ready to go for the next stage, which is the 30 million pot. Will that be there for another three years following on from next year? Or is it a question of you're just test driving this? Well, the endowments programme, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Keith say something in a minute because I didn't want to invite him along just to sit here. Um, the endowments and the, this scheme that we've got, the 30 million, are one-offs at the moment. I mean, this was an, a, an initiative from the government and then we piggybacked the capacity building the next year on the back of it. The 7 million scheme is a rolling, so there's a, there's a go at it when applications open in 1st of April and there'll be another go at it next year. I can't, it, certainly in the current climate, I can't predict what's going to be possible going down the line, whether this is, this is a way forward we want to go, whether it's been really successful, it's something we'd like to try again. I can't predict that. For now, I think you need to think of them as one-offs, okay? But Keith might, you know, Secretary of State might have whispered something differently into his ear. He might know something I don't. I doubt that very much, <laughs> <laughs> particularly if I'm being filmed right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's quite straightforward from a DCMS perspective. We uh, had to work very hard to carve out £30 million from a spending review settlement to put into Catalyst. That's all we've got. Our pockets are now empty through to the financial year 2014-15. I think uh, the collective incentive around this is that if the sector can demonstrate that we use the money that... DCMS, Arts Council and HLF put into this uh, pot wisely, then that strengthens our opportunity for getting the Treasury to be enlightened about this for the next funding cycle. Can I just clarify one thing? That, that I'm sure you all got it, that Keith said. He talked about 30 million. His 30 million isn't the 30 million capacity building and match funding. The 30 million from the government is 15 million for endowments and 15 with us, and 15 million for endowments with Heritage Lottery Fund. So that also happens to add up to 30 million. It's a different 30 million. Okay. Another question. Thank you. Uh, we have two. If we take the lady here, because the microphone's there, and then we'll come to you, sir. Um, it's a question about um, the consortium bids because that's not really been discussed today and I'm not exactly sure in my mind how that might work in terms both of what kind of partnership working you might foresee or encourage and also which, how, who would be the accountable body in such a bid, that, mm. those sorts of general questions. Mm. Okay, for, no, I'm happy to talk to that one. Um, well, I, I was really keen on the consortiums because, again, in terms of the current climate and the future, um, collaboration seems really important to me. And also, just after I joined the Arts Council, I got taken up to Newcastle and I met with um, some members of the Newcastle and Gateshead Cultural Venues Consortium, which has been going for about three years. And I was really excited by the way they've been uh, cooperating and collaborating and saving money and sharing finance and HR and all kinds of all kinds of things. So I really was really keen on getting something in that would encourage collaboration collaboration and consortiums. And if you can get things, if you can get consortiums and collaborations going that are across art form as well, great, you know, good stuff, whatever you can come up with that's creative, very exciting. Um, what we've done in the application form is we have asked for an arts organisation to be the lead member of the consortium as far as the application is concerned. We've also said, in the as you go through the application form, have you consorted before? <laughs> 
in the nicest possible way. If so, tell us how. And if you haven't, tell us how you propose sort of embedding this consortium, because we don't want sort of the lead organisation perhaps being landed with, you know, if, it's something, if people don't get match funding and something goes pear-shaped, we don't want one organisation being landed with it. So if you haven't, if it's a new consortium and a new collaboration, good stuff, but just sort of make sure you've thought about your terms of reference and how you plan to operate as a, as a collaboration. Does that help? Okay, good. Uh, question, the gentleman at the back. Um, Art Hewitt, this Royal Margate. It's a bit left field, this, but um, being a manager of a Grade Two star listed building, uh, I just I know this is the Arts Council part of Catalyst. Is there a similar sort of Heritage Lottery? Does Heritage Lottery have a similar sort of program in terms of the three tier? No. Or is it purely endowments there? No. Uh, the the slide I put up this morning. Yep. You remember? Well, well, yeah, I was trying to remember, and then I thought <laughs> maybe there might be. Yeah. Well, I, I showed that endowments we're both doing. Yeah. So you know we've got 15 million from the government and um, from from Keith's piggy bank, and we've added 10 million in to make a 25 million endowment scheme for Arts Council England. Um, the Heritage Lottery Fund have taken the same well, not the same, but another 15 million, and have added in. Um, t well, I need to think this one through another 15 million themselves, which takes it up to 30. We then decided to do the capacity building and added those in, and Heritage Lottery Fund thought that was a jolly good idea. And they've got a small capacity building um, fund. So whereas we've got a 30 million and then the 7 million that's coming in the new year, yeah. they've got the, they haven't got the equivalent of our 30 million. They've got the equivalent of um, our 7 million, which is 5 million. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. <laughs> Clear as mud. Um, <laughs> thank you. There's a question here. And there are other panel members. I appreciate the catalyst is the, the key focus of the day, but do, do feel free to ask another panel member a question. Please. You? <laughs> yeah. uh, this question is, uh, sorry, Kate Danby Gate Theatre. Uh, this is a question for Keith. Um, this, uh, obviously, today's event and catalyst is about encouraging a culture of asking uh, within arts organizations. Um, I'm interested to hear more about what DCMS is doing to encourage a culture of giving amongst uh, wider society, and in particular, uh, those individuals who probably have the capacity to give but aren't already recognized philanthropists, either to the arts or, or to other sectors. Um, can I answer a question with a question, first of all, and, and ask, how many people here are aware of DCMS's 10-point action plan for philanthropy? A few, right. We're, we're clearly failing to communicate. Um, we have a 10-point action plan. Uh, amidst that, we have things like strengthening recognition for those who give. So uh, in part, that's about the honor system, uh, which of course needs to be managed very sensitively and we're not suddenly installing a, a tariff whereby uh, you give X million and you get a knighthood. It doesn't work that way. What we want to encourage is long-term sustained giving at all levels. So people who give uh, significant sums according to their means on a sustained basis should be recognized. This is not, absolutely not, just about major donors. Uh, we are trying to get better at saying thank you uh, I would certainly echo Philip's point about the need to thank donors, and government uh, should be doing that as well. Um, we have quite basic things like uh, receptions in Downing Street, for not just for those who give, but for those who we think may be prospects. And I think advocacy is something that we still need to get better at, and that's not just DCMS, but the whole of government. I would encourage you to read the Giving White Paper if you haven't had a chance yet. That talks about how we can encourage uh, giving behavior. And I think if there's anything that you think government is not doing, then you should let us know. Because in a way, we're only here to help make your lives easier. So if that means there are occasions where it might be useful for a minister, if you think there's any value in a minister writing to somebody who's just given you a significant gift, then we can engineer that. Anything like that or anything else that we're not doing at the moment, do let us know. I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that, if I may, 
is that th there's been a lot of um, very interesting documents around philanthropy about what the government can do, which they're doing, and what the donors can do. But, but even the Thomas Hughes Hallett philanthropy didn't talk about what charities can do. And I think that you have a very important role in this in terms of asking in the right way and managing the relationships. Um, ultimately, I would argue that the solution is in your hands, not in anyone else. The government can do an awful lot to help, but, but you, it's the relationship with you that is really going to matter to the donor. Um, and it's, I think it's important to make sure that all the arts are asking in the right way, uh, the right people in the right way. It's, it's absolutely, the two go hand in hand. It's about getting better at, at asking and getting better at giving. I, I didn't answer the last part of your question. Um, although this is not all just about major donors and high net worth individuals, we know and, and CAF shout regularly about the uh, people, less wealthy people giving more uh, than wealthy, and that's absolutely right. We should not hector people into giving, but we should make it very clear that we believe the rich should give more. Another question. Nothing. <laughs> You're all absolutely clear on the catalyst program. No, we have a confusion. Uh, Excellent. This is a, this There's a microphone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This isn't a question about catalyst funding, actually. It's a question that you mentioned, that you brought up, and you talked about the BP um, Tate yes. uh, relationship and liberate Tate. And, and actually, you know, as we are all encouraged, and we will be going for more private monies, corporate sponsorship, I'm sure this will come up time and time again. We've seen the debate in the papers about the whole poetry prize. Um, questions have been asked. We're all value driven organizations, sometimes one could say cynically that sponsors buy in for greenwash or you know all the rest of it. I think it's going to be something we're going to be increasingly navigating as, 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 the, as the years go by. It would just be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I, as someone who once got tobacco money for a kid's play, as you can see, my line in the sand is pretty far down in that direction. Um, uh, I, and JTI, uh, Japan Tobacco International, fabulous organization. And I've, I've read the uh, oil or platform thing. Um, I am a firm believer that if we have them as a business in this company, if, in this country, if they hire members of staff and we allow them to license to operate, then why the hell shouldn't they sponsor the arts? Um, you know, what are we going to do? Stop people arriving in cars? If, if the state is showing a painting that has been driven to the building, is that not allowed in? If, if a member of staff of BP wants to donate money, should that money be refused? Where on earth do you draw the line here? Um, uh, if, it, if it's an illegal business, clearly it shouldn't sponsor, but if it's an illegal business, I'm all for sponsoring, and, and I know Japan Tobacco International uh, are very clear about what they can and cannot do, and incredibly conscientious in that. Yeah, we, we, I, I completely respect the right of poets, artists, anyone to uh, stand back from anything that they don't want to be engaged with. But uh, I, I think sometimes the people that, that take that position have the luxury of not being uh, required to provide an alternative. And I think, given that, that BP has been supporting the arts for, I think, about 20 years now, if not more, um, the fact that they do have 15,000 employees in this country, and if what we care about is uh, growth and the economy as a healthy environment in which the arts can flourish, then I think we should welcome BP's sponsorship of the arts. I think similarly with Aurum, uh, I, I've seen all sorts of um, interpretation of the debate around the, the T.S. Eliot Prize, but uh, just lobbing a brick at the whole of capitalism doesn't really sound to me like a solution. Uh, we run awards every year, and um, uh, they're sponsored by BP in one year, uh, Desvia Lars from BP stood up to make the announcement. And then two um, uh, activists rushed the stage at the Barbican uh, to make their point. But no one had taught them voice projection. So they were in the stage going, rah, rah, rah. no one could hear what they were saying. But there was a signer to the right of the stage. So the only people that got the environmental message were the deaf. And I didn't know, but it, it somehow looked glorious up there. And eventually someone pulled them off the stage. Do you want to say something about I remember that. I was there. <laughs> it's pretty much what happened. Um, uh, gosh. Um, 
so much to say on this topic. I mean, I, I guess that my... I mean, you heard my presentation earlier and you heard me say how difficult it is. And certainly if we were in a position whereby we had an in through one of my board members who made an introduction to one of those companies, I suspect I would be biting their hand off and working out how we could collaborate effectively. Um, they are complicated partnerships. There are exceptional complications around JTI. Um, and um, it is exceptionally fraught. And I'm in a fortunate position whereby I've never really had to make this decision personally. I was on the periphery of working with BAT when I was at the London Symphony Orchestra, which was a very, very, very low-key partnership. Um, we're all in the business of trying to make our arts organisations greater and looking at all of those areas we were talking about earlier and trying to achieve more and grow those areas. So if there was a possibility of doing that by partnering with a legal entity, I'd probably be at the front of the queue. I'm sorry. No, I, yeah. I think I would, um, I would echo that, um, even though Wigmore Hall hasn't got a huge history on uh, corporate sponsorship. But I think it would be a great shame if the contribution that BP has made over the many years that it's been associated with Tate would be dismissed um, as a result of this um, particular crisis. I mean, again, thanking them for their contribution is also important. Thanking our donors and recognising the contribution they've made in the past is, is incredibly important. I think ultimately it comes down to your, your customers. If they're going to get upset by it, then you probably shouldn't do it. Customers were very upset about it, and uh, therefore, again, it comes back to communicating with them and trying to convey the message about why you're entering into that partnership and what the alternative is. And if there is no real alternative and people are on board and you've successfully developed those relationships, we, in the past, in my experience, we've been able to steer a course through that successfully. That's a question, gentleman behind in the blue. Um. Raj Ratnam from Visiting Arts. I know um, it's a question for Keith, actually. Um, we run the cultural contact point for, uh, for England, for UK, if you like. So there, there's a point for people who are applying for European funding to come to us to ask for advice as to how best to apply for European funding. In a similar way, I know there are lots of small arts organizations here who can't afford to have a fundraiser, a specific fundraiser. And people from different fields are having to become fundraisers for organizations. Is there any way that you can provide um, free training or uh, funding for free training for people who are not natural fundraisers to become better fundraisers? That will provide a long-term solution for arts organizations in fundraising. Uh, I hope so, yes. Um, I think there are, at the moment there, there's actually a lot of training provision out there that, that's not being fully exploited and, and, I, and I'd like to see that being made full use of uh, before we start creating new things. And, and I'm hoping that uh, in particular the Arts Council and the Institute of Fundraising will uh, develop a dialogue whereby uh, training might form part of that. Um, the word free, I, I, I just hesitate at slightly because I, I, I think sometimes uh, the value of something gets lost if, it, if it's entirely free. I think I would certainly approach it as from the perspective of any organization looking to, to build its capacity. In, in terms of business development in any form, it, it comes back to leadership. and. I think one of the things I wanted to say while I'm up here is, is that for, for you, those of you here who are fundraisers, what I've been struck by as I go around the country is how many organizations still have boards or leaders who abdicate responsibility for fundraising or employ someone, call them head of fundraising, and then move on and, and just let them get on with it. And I, I don't know to what extent you, you talked about this this morning, I wasn't here. but. I think we, we absolutely have to address that leadership failure. And I also see that it's an incredibly, uh, it's often a very lonely existence as a fundraiser. And I think it's incumbent on government, the Arts Council, and others 
to provide some form of pastoral support. Any other questions? You've exhausted. That's been a long day. If there are no other questions, and this is your last chance, although you can go and speak to your relationship manager, yeah, I'm sure, um, I will hand over. Sorry, can I? Yes, please do. I just wanted to say one other thing because I, I, I like to try and do a bit of myth busting while I'm, uh, <laughs> particularly if I'm being filmed. If this is on YouTube, all the better. <laughs> we are not enthralled to America. <laughs> that there are things that we can learn. There are techniques that we can learn from uh, some organisations in America, just as there are things that we can learn from organisations in. Australia, in, uh, dare I say it, France, mm -hmm. and all sorts of other places. So we should absolutely uh, assimilate lessons from abroad, but we are not looking to transpose the American funding model into this country, and nor do we think that, the, uh, that America does it all brilliantly. Thank you for that. Um, I, and whilst we're on that subject, in terms of the training, Arts and Business is still running its training for a, certainly a little while, and you can always phone us up and you'll get a free bit of advice uh, on the phone or in person if that was of, and it would be of any use to you. Anyway, enough of that. Um, I will hand over to Ginny, if I may, at this point, to okay. close the day. Right, well, first of all, huge thanks to all of our speakers today. Um, and it's very nice that, uh, that we've that we still got Mary Helen and Jennifer on the platform. And thanks to Keith for coming along, and of course to Philip, who always really energises the afternoons, which is marvellous. I also just want to say a big thanks to our relationship managers who've been scattered around during the day. They've had an incredibly difficult task over the last few months with all the strategic funds that the Arts Council has been launching at once and um, a catalyst and capital have often got confused and been called capitalist um, and I'm, I'm not kidding you as people have got tired and and the nuances and the complications of completely new strategic funds they have been really working at an incredible pace and um, as I've been traveling around the country I've been in absolute awe at the role of our that our relationship managers have been playing I really have I also want to say huge thanks to um, the team today that have been sort of running around with microphones and and um, showing you to rooms and taking notes and, and all the rest of it. Um, the, 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 they're great, and everywhere we've gone, we've, we've used people from the local office to help us with that, and, and that's marvellous. Um, my penultimate thanks, and I'd like her to stand up, and she'll be very embarrassed by this, but Priya has organised, please stand up, has organised all the workshops, <laughs> and she and I, and Philip, have been going around the country um, do doing five of these over the last two weeks and it's been enormously uh, pressurised and sorting out venues and catering and rooms and AV and all kinds of things that I just, just haven't got myself involved in at all to say nothing of all the packs and Priya has been absolute brick and has done all of this and I have just haven't, I just sailed up and I haven't needed to worry so I know I've thanked you myself but I'd, huge thanks to you. Uh, and finally, um, a, a really big thanks to all of you, which is thank you for coming, thank you for participating so actively during the day and interacting. And it's been really, uh, it's been really interesting. I've really enjoyed the discussions, and I'm just sorry I haven't been able to. I wish the masterclasses weren't concurrent almost because I haven't been able to get around the other rooms. But you've been a highly interactive and participative um, a group of people, and thank you very much indeed for coming and making it like that. Thank you.